Letter the first of a collection of letters by Jane Austen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae Jane Austen, read by Michelle Eaton. A.F. Read by Wendy Katz Hiller. Augusta read by Krista Zaleski. Sophia, read by Jen Broda. Miss Jane, read by Lynette Calkins. Maria Williams, read by Hannah Dormer. Mrs. Williams, read by Therese Lintel. Lady Greville, read by Dawn Sutton. Ellen Greville, read by Kay Burke. Impertinent Young Lady, read by T. J. Burns. Miss Grenville, read by Bethany Baldwin. Henrietta Halton, read by Michelle Purdy. Tom Musgrove, read by David Purdy. Lady Scudamore, read by Anna Maria. Narrator, read by Jim Hedrick. A Collection of Letters. To Miss Cooper, cousin conscious of the charming character which in every country and every clime in Christendom is cried, concerning you with caution and care, I commend to your charitable criticism this clever collection of curious comments, which have been carefully culled, collected, and classed by your comical cousin, the author. A Collection of Letters Letter the first from a mother to her friend. My children begin now to claim all my attention in different manner from that in which they have been used to receive it, as they are now arrived at that age when it is necessary for them in some measure to become conversant with the world. My Augusta is seventeen, and her sister scarcely a twelve-month younger, I flatter myself that their education has been such as will not disgrace their appearance in the world, and that they will not disgrace their education, I have every reason to believe. Indeed, they are sweet girls, sensible yet unaffected, accomplished yet easy, lively yet gentle. As their progress in everything they have learnt has been always the same, I am willing to forget the difference of age and to introduce them together into public. This very evening is fixed on as their first entree into life, as we are to drink tea with Mrs. Cope and her daughter. I am glad that we are to meet no one, for my girl's sake, as it would be awkward for them to enter too wide a circle on the very first day. But we shall proceed by degrees. Tomorrow, Mr. Stanley's family will drink tea with us, and perhaps the Miss Phillipses will meet them. On Tuesday, we shall pay morning visits. On Wednesday, we are to dine at Westbrook. On Thursday, we have company at home. On Friday, we are to be at a private concert at Sir John Winner's, and on Saturday, we expect Miss Dawson to call in the morning which will complete my daughter's introduction into life. How they will bear so much dissipation I cannot imagine. Of their spirits I have no fear. I only dread their health. This mighty affair is now happily over, and my girls are out. As the moment approached for our departure, you can have no idea how the sweet creatures trembled with fear and expectation. Before the carriage drove to the door, I called them into my dressing-room, and as soon as they were seated thus addressed them, My dear girls, the moment is now arrived when I am to reap the rewards of all my anxieties and labours towards you during your education. You are this evening to enter a world in which you will meet with many wonderful things, Yet let me warn you against suffering yourselves to be meanly swayed by the follies and vices of others. 
for believe me my beloved children that if you do i shall be very sorry for it they both assured me that they would ever remember my advice with gratitude and follow it with attention that they were prepared to find a world full of things to amaze and to shock them but that they trusted their behavior would never give me reason to repent the watchful care with which i had presided over their infancy and formed their minds with such expectations and such intentions cried i i can have nothing to fear from you and can cheerfully conduct you to mrs copes without a fear of your being seduced by her example or contaminated by her follies come then my children added i the carriage is driving to the door and i will not a moment delay the happiness you are so impatient to enjoy when we arrived at Worley, poor augusta could scarcely breathe while margaret was all life and rapture the long-expected moment is now arrived said she and we shall soon be in the world in a few moments we were in mrs cope's parlour where with her daughter she sat ready to receive us i observed with delight the impression my children made on them they were indeed two sweet elegant-looking girls and though somewhat abashed from the peculiarity of their situation yet there was an ease in their manners and address which could not fail of pleasing imagine my dear madam how delighted i must have been in beholding as i did how attentively they observed every object they saw how disgusted with some things how enchanted with others how astonished at all on the whole however they returned in raptures with the world its inhabitants and manners yours ever a f End of Letter the First Letter the Second of A Collection of Letters by Jane Austen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Collection of Letters Letter the Second from a young lady crossed in love to her friend why should this last disappointment hang so heavily on my spirits why should i feel it more why should it wound me deeper than those i have experienced before can it be that i have a greater affection for willoughby than i had for his amiable predecessors or is it that our feelings become more acute from being often wounded i must suppose my dear belle that this is the case since i am not conscious of being more sincerely attached to willoughby than i was to neville fitzowen or either of the crawfords for all of whom i once felt the most lasting affection that ever warmed a woman's heart tell me then dear belle why i still sigh when i think of the faithless edward or why i weep when i behold his bride for too surely this is the case my friends are all alarmed for me they fear my declining health they lament my want of spirits they dread the effects of both in hopes of relieving my melancholy by directing my thoughts to other objects they have invited several of their friends to spend the christmas with us lady bridget darkwood and her sister-in-law miss jane are expected on friday and colonel seaton's family will be with us next week this is all most kindly meant by my uncle and cousins but what can the presence of a dozen indifferent people do to me but weary and distress me i will not finish my letter till some of our visitors are arrived friday evening lady bridget came this morning and with her her sweet sister miss jane although i have been acquainted with this charming woman above fifteen years yet i never before observed how lovely she is she is now about thirty-five and in spite of sickness sorrow and time is more blooming than i ever saw a girl of seventeen i was delighted with her the moment she entered the house and she appeared equally pleased with me 
attaching herself to me during the remainder of the day. There is something so sweet, so mild in her countenance, that she seems more than mortal. Her conversation is as bewitching as her appearance. I could not help telling her how much she engaged my admiration. Oh, Miss Jane, said I, and stopped from an inability at the moment of expressing myself as I could wish. Oh, Miss Jane, I repeated, I could not think of words to suit my feelings. She seemed waiting for my speech. I was confused, distressed, my thoughts were bewildered, and I could only add, How do you do? She saw and felt for my embarrassment, and with admirable presence of mind, relieved me from it by saying, My dear Sophia, be not uneasy at having exposed yourself. I will turn the conversation without appearing to notice it. Oh, how I loved her for her kindness. Do you ride as much as you used to do? said she. I am advised to ride by my physician. We have delightful rides round us. I have a charming horse, am uncommonly fond of the amusement, replied I, quite recovered from my confusion, and in short I ride a great deal. You are in the right, my love, said she. Then repeating the following line, which was an extempore and equally adapted to recommend both writing and candor. Ride where you may, be candid where you can, she added. I rode once, but it is many years ago. She spoke this in so low and tremulous a voice that I was silent. Struck with her manner of speaking, I could make no reply. I have not ridden continued she, fixing her eyes on my face. Since I was married. I was never so surprised. Married, ma'am? I repeated. You may well wear that look of astonishment, said she, since what I have said must appear improbable to you, yet nothing is more true than that I was once married. Then why are you called Miss Jane? I married, my Sophia, without the consent or knowledge of my father, the late Admiral Ansley. It was therefore necessary to keep the secret from him and from every one till some fortunate opportunity might offer of revealing it. Such an opportunity, alas, was but too soon given in the death of my dear Captain Dashwood. Pardon these tears, continued Miss Jane, wiping her eyes. I owe them to my husband's memory. He fell, my Sophia, while fighting for his country in America after a most happy union of seven years. My children, two sweet boys and a girl, who had constantly resided with my father and me, passing with him and with every one as the children of a brother, though I had ever been an only child, had as yet been the comforts of my life. But no sooner had I lost my Henry than these sweet creatures fell sick and died. Conceive, dear Sophia, what my feelings must have been when, as an aunt, I attended my children to their early grave. My father did not survive them many weeks. He died, poor good old man, happily ignorant to his last hour of my marriage. But did you not own it and assume his name at your husband's death? No, I could not bring myself to do it, more especially when in my children I lost all inducement for doing it. Lady Bridget and yourself are the only persons who are in the knowledge of my having ever been either wife or mother. As I could not prevail on myself to take the name of Dashwood, a name which after my Henry's death I could never hear without emotion and as I was conscious of having no right to that of Ansley, I dropped all thoughts of either, and have made it a point of bearing only my Christian one since my father's death. She paused. Oh, my dear Miss Jane, said I, how infinitely am I obliged to you for so entertaining a story. You cannot think how it has diverted me. But have you quite done? I have only to add, my dear Sophia, that my Henry's elder brother dying about the same time, Lady Bridget became a widow like myself, and as we have always loved each other in idea from the high character in which we had ever been spoken of, 
though we had never met, we determined to live together. We wrote to one another on the same subject by the same post. So exactly did our feeling and our actions coincide. We both eagerly embraced the proposals we gave and received of becoming one family and have from that time lived together in the greatest affection. And is this all? said I. I hope you have not done. Indeed I have. And did you ever hear a story more pathetic? I never did, and it is for that reason it pleases me so much, for when one is unhappy nothing is so delightful to one's sensations as to hear of equal misery. Ah, uh, but my Sophia, why are you unhappy? Have you not heard, madam, of Willoughby's marriage? But, my love, why lament his perfidy when you bore so well that of many young men before? Ah, madam, I was used to it then, but when Willoughby broke his engagements, I had not been disappointed for half a year. Poor girl, said Miss Jane. End of Letter the Second Letter the Third of a Collection of Letters by Jane Austen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Collection of Letters. Letter the Third from a Young Lady in Distressed Circumstances to Her Friend. A few days ago, I was at a private ball given by Mr. Ashburnham. As my mother never goes out, she entrusted me to the care of Lady Greville, who did me the honour of calling for me in her way, and of allowing me to sit forwards, which is a favour about which I am very indifferent, especially as I know it is considered as conferring a great obligation on me. So, Miss Maria, said her ladyship as she saw me advancing to the door of the carriage, you seem very smart tonight. My poor girls will appear quite to disadvantage by you. I only hope your mother may not have distressed herself to set you off. Have you got a new gown on? Yes, ma'am, replied I with as much indifference as I could assume. Aye, and a fine one too, I think. Feeling it, as by her permission I seated myself by her. I dare say it is all very smart, but I must own for you know I always speak my mind, that I think it was quite a needless piece of expense. Why could not you have worn your old striped one? It is not my way to find fault with people because they are poor, for I always think that they are more to be despised and pitied than blamed for it, especially if they cannot help it. But, at the same time, I must say that in my opinion, your old striped gown would have been quite fine enough for its wearer. For to tell you the truth, I always speak my mind, I am very much afraid that one half of the people in the room will not know whether you have a gown on or not. But I suppose you intend to make your fortune tonight. Well, the sooner, the better, and I wish you success. Indeed, ma'am, I have no such intention. Who ever heard a young lady own that she was a fortune hunter? Miss Greville laughed, but I am sure Ellen felt for me. Was your mother gone to bed before you left her? said her ladyship. Dear ma'am, said Ellen, it is but nine o'clock. True, Ellen, but candles cost money, and Mrs. Williams is too wise to be extravagant. She was just sitting down to supper, ma'am. And what had she got for supper? I did not observe. Bread and cheese, I suppose. I should never wish for a better supper, said Ellen. You have never any reason, replied her mother, as a better is always provided for you. Miss Greville laughed excessively, as she constantly does at her mother's wit. Such is the humiliating situation in which I am forced to appear while riding in her ladyship's coach, 
I dare not be impertinent, as my mother is always admonishing me to be humble and patient if I wish to make my way in the world. She insists on my accepting every invitation of Lady Greville, or you may be certain that I would never enter either her house or her coach, with the disagreeable certainty I always have of being abused for my poverty while I am in them. When we arrived at Ashburnham, it was nearly ten o'clock, which was an hour and a half later than we were desired to be there, but Lady Greville is too fashionable, or fancies herself to be so, to be punctual. The dancing, however, was not begun, as they waited for Miss Greville. I had not been long in the room before I was engaged to dance by Mr. Burnet, but just as we were going to stand up, he recollected that his servant had got his white gloves, and immediately ran out to fetch them. In the meantime the dancing began, and Lady Greville, in passing to another room, went exactly before me. She saw me, and instantly stopping, said to me, though there were several people close to us, Hey day, Miss Maria. What cannot you get a partner? Poor young lady. I am afraid your new gown was put on for nothing. But do not despair. Perhaps you may get a hop before the evening is over. So saying, she passed on, without hearing my repeated assurance of being engaged, and leaving me very much provoked at being so exposed before every one. Mr. Burnet, however, soon returned, and by coming to me the moment he entered the room and leading me to the dancers, my character, I hope, was cleared from the imputation Lady Greville had thrown on it, in the eyes of all the old ladies who had heard her speech. I soon forgot all my vexations in the pleasure of dancing, and of having the most agreeable partner in the room. As he is moreover heir to a very large estate, I could see that Lady Greville did not look very well pleased when she found who had been his choice. She was determined to mortify me, and accordingly when we were sitting down between the dances, she came to me with more than her usual insulting importance, attended by Miss Mason, and said, loud enough to be heard by half the people in the room, Pray, Miss Maria, in what way of business was your grandfather? For Miss Mason and I cannot agree whether he was a grocer or a bookbinder. I saw that she wanted to mortify me, and was resolved, if I possibly could, to prevent her seeing that her scheme succeeded. Neither, madam. He was a wine merchant. Aye, I knew he was in some such low way. He broke, did not he? I believe not, ma'am. Did not he abscond? I never heard that he did. At least he died insolvent. I was never told so before. Why, was not your father as poor as a rat? I fancy not. Was not he in the king's bench once? I never saw him there. She gave me such a look, and turned away in a great passion, while I was half delighted with myself for my impertinence, and half afraid of being thought too saucy. As Lady Greville was extremely angry with me, she took no further notice of me all the evening, and indeed, had I been in favour, I should have been equally neglected, as she was got into a party of great folks, and she never speaks to me when she can to anyone else. Miss Greville was with her mother's party at supper, but Ellen preferred staying with the Burnets and me. We had a very pleasant dance, and as Lady G slept all the way home, I had a very comfortable ride. The next day while we were at dinner, Lady Greville's coach stopped at the door, for that is the time of day she generally contrives it should. She sent in a message by the servant to say that she should not get out, but that Miss Maria must come to the coach door as she wanted to speak to her, and that she must make haste and come immediately. What an impertinent message, Mamma! said I. Go, Maria, replied she. Accordingly I went and was obliged to stand there at her ladyship's pleasure, though the wind was extremely high and very cold. Why, I think, Miss Maria, you are not quite so smart as you were last night. But I did not come to examine your dress, but to tell you that you may dine with us the day after tomorrow. Not tomorrow, remember. Do not come tomorrow, for we expect Lord and Lady Claremont and Sir Thomas Stanley's family. There will be no occasion for your being very fine for I shan't send the carriage. If it rains, you may take an umbrella. I could hardly help laughing at hearing her give me leave to keep myself dry. And pray remember to be in time, for I shan't wait. I hate my victuals overdone. But you need not come before the time. How does your mother do? She is at dinner, is not she? Yes, ma'am. We were in the middle of dinner when your ladyship came. I'm afraid you find it very cold, Maria, said Ellen. 
Yes, it is an horrible east wind, said her mother. I assure you I can hardly bear the window down. But you are used to be blown about by the wind, Miss Maria, and that is what has made your complexion so rudely and coarse. You young ladies who cannot often ride in a carriage, never mind what weather you trudge in or how the wind shoes your legs. I would not have my girl stand out of doors as you do in such a day as this. But some sort of people have no feelings either of cold or delicacy. Well, remember that we shall expect you on Thursday at five o'clock. You must tell your maid to come for you at night. There will be no moon, and you will have a hard walk home. My comps to your mother. I am afraid your dinner will be cold. Drive on. And away she went, leaving me in a great passion with her, as she always does. Maria Williams End of Letter the Third Letter the Fourth of a Collection of Letters by Jane Austen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Collection of Letters. Letter the Fourth from a young lady rather impertinent to her friend. We dined yesterday with Mr. Evelyn where we were introduced to a very agreeable-looking girl his cousin i was extremely pleased with her appearance for added to the charms of an engaging face her manner and voice had something peculiarly interesting in them so much so that they inspired me with a great curiosity to know the history of her life who were her parents where she came from and what had befallen her for it was then only known that she was a relation of mr evelyn and that her name was Grenville. In the evening, a favorable opportunity offered to me of attempting at least to know what I wished to know, for every one played cards but Mrs. Evelyn, my mother, Dr. Drayton, Miss Grenville, and myself. And as the two former were engaged in a whispering conversation, and the doctor fell asleep, we were of necessity obliged to entertain each other. This was what I wished and being determined not to remain in ignorance for want of asking, I began the conversation in the following manner. Have you been long in Essex, ma'am? I arrived on Tuesday. You came from Derbyshire? No, ma'am. Appearing surprised at my question. From Suffolk. You will think this is a good dash of mine, my dear Mary, but you know that I am not wanting for impudence when I have any end in view. Are you pleased with the country, Miss Grenville? Do you find it equal to the one you have left? Much superior, ma'am, in point of beauty. She sighed. I longed to know for why. But the face of any country, however beautiful, said I, can be but a poor consolation for the loss of one's dearest friends. She shook her head, as if she felt the truth of what I said. My curiosity was so much raised that I was resolved at any rate to satisfy it. You regret having left Suffolk, then, Miss Grenville? Indeed, I do. You were born there, I suppose? Yes, ma'am, I was, and passed many happy years there. That is a great comfort, said I. I hope, ma'am, that you never spent any unhappy ones there. Perfect felicity is not the property of mortals, and no one has a right to expect uninterrupted happiness. Some misfortunes I have certainly met with. What misfortunes, dear ma'am? replied I, burning with impatience to know everything. None, ma'am, I hope that have been the effect of any willful fault in me. I dare say not, ma'am, and have no doubt that any sufferings you may have experienced could arise only from the cruelties of relations or the errors of friends she sighed you seem unhappy my dear miss grenville is it in my power to soften your misfortunes your power ma'am 
replied she extremely surprised it is in no one's power to make me happy she pronounced these words in so mournful and solemn an accent that for some time i had not courage to reply i was actually silenced i recovered myself however in a few moments and looking at her with all the affection i could my dear miss grenville said i you appear extremely young and may probably stand in need of someone's advice whose regard for you joined to superior age perhaps superior judgment might authorize her to give it i am that person and i now challenge you to accept the offer i make you of my confidence and friendship in return to which i shall only ask for yours you are extremely obliging ma'am said she and i am highly flattered by your attention to me but i am in no difficulty no doubt no uncertainty of situation in which any advice can be wanted whenever i am however continued she brightening into a complacent smile i shall know where to apply i bowed but felt a good deal mortified by such a repulse still however i had not given up my point i found that by the appearance of sentiment and friendship nothing was to be gained and determined therefore to renew my attacks by questions and suppositions do you intend staying long in this part of england miss grenville yes ma'am some time i believe but how will mr and mrs grenville bear your absence they are neither of them alive ma'am this was an answer i did not expect i was quite silenced and never felt so awkward in my life end of letter the fourth letter the fifth of a collection of letters by jane austen this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Collection of Letters Letter the Fifth From a Young Lady Very Much in Love to Her Friend My uncle gets more stingy, my aunt more particular, and I more in love every day. What shall we all be? at this rate by the end of the year i had this morning the happiness of receiving the following letter from my dear musgrove sackville street january seventh it is a month to-day since i first beheld my lovely henrietta and the sacred anniversary must and shall be kept in a manner becoming the day by writing to her never shall i forget the moment when her beauties first broke on my sight no time as you well know can erase it from my memory it was at lady scudamore's happy lady scudamore to live within a mile of the divine henrietta when the lovely creature first entered the room oh what were my sensations the sight of you was like the sight of a wonderful fine thing I started, I gazed at her with admiration. She appeared every moment more charming, and the unfortunate Musgrove became a captive to your charms before I had time to look about me. Yes, madam, I had the happiness of adoring you, and happiness for which I cannot be too grateful. What? said he to himself. Is Musgrove allowed to die for Henrietta? Enviable mortal! And may he pine for her, who is the object of universal admiration, who is adored by a colonel and toasted by a baronet? Adorable Henrietta, how beautiful you are! I declare you are quite divine. You are more than mortal. You are an angel. You are Venus herself. In short, madam, you are the prettiest girl I ever saw in my life, and her beauty is increased in her Musgrove's eyes by permitting him to love her and allowing me to hope and ah oh, angelic miss henrietta 
Heaven is my witness how ardently I do hope for the death of your villainous uncle and his abandoned wife, since my fair one will not consent to be mine till their decease has placed her in affluence above what my fortune can procure. Though it is an improvable estate. Cruel Henrietta to persist in such a resolution. I am at present with my sister where I mean to continue till my own house, which, though an excellent one, is at present somewhat out of repair, is ready to receive me. Amiable princess of my heart, farewell, of that heart which trembles while it signs itself your most ardent admirer and devoted humble servant, T. Musgrove. There is a pattern for a love letter, Matilda. Did you ever read such a masterpiece of writing? Such sense, such sentiment, such purity of thought, such flow of language, and such unfeigned love in one sheet? No, never I can answer for it, since a Musgrove is not to be met with by every girl. Oh, how I long to be with him. I intend to send him the following in answer to his letter tomorrow. My dearest Musgrove, words cannot express how happy your letter made me. I thought I should have cried for joy, for I love you better than anybody in the world. I think you the most amiable and the handsomest man in England, and so to be sure you are. I never read so sweet a letter in my life. Do write me another, just like it, and tell me you are in love with me in every other line. I quite die to see you. How shall we manage to see one another, for we are so much in love that we cannot live asunder? Oh, my dear Musgrove, you cannot think how impatiently I wait for the death of my uncle and aunt. If they will not die soon, I believe I shall run mad, for I get more in love with you every day of my life. How happy your sister is to enjoy the pleasure of your company in her house, and how happy everybody in London must be because you are there. I hope you will be so kind as to write to me again soon, for I never read such sweet letters as yours. I am, my dearest Musgrove, most truly and faithfully yours for ever and ever. Henrietta Halton I hope he will like my answer. It is as good a one as I can write, though nothing to his. Indeed, I had always heard what a dab he was at a love letter. I saw him, you know, for the first time at Lady Scudamore's, and when I saw her ladyship afterwards, she asked me how I liked her cousin Musgrove. Why, upon my word, said I, I think he is a very handsome young man. I am glad you think so, replied she, for he is distractedly in love with you. La, Lady Scudamore, said I, how can you talk so ridiculously? Nay, tis very true, answered she. I assure you, for he was in love with you from the first moment he beheld you. I wish it may be true, said I, for that is the only kind of love I would give a farthing for. There is some sense in being in love at first sight. Well, I give you joy of your conquest, replied Lady Scudamore, and I believe it to have been a very complete one. I am sure it is not a contemptible one, for my cousin is a charming young fellow, has seen a great deal of the world, and writes the best love letters I ever read. This made me very happy, and I was excessively pleased with my conquest. However, I thought it was proper to give myself a few airs, so I said to her, This is all very pretty, Lady Scudamore, but you know that we young ladies who are heiresses must not throw ourselves away upon men who have no fortune at all. My dear Miss Halton, said she, I am as much convinced of that as you can be, and I do assure you that I should be the last person to encourage your marrying any one who had not some pretensions to expect a fortune with you. Mr. Musgrove is so far from being poor that he has an estate of several hundreds a year which is capable of great improvement, and an excellent house, though at present it is not quite in repair. If that is the case, replied I, I have nothing more to say against him, and if, as you say, he is an informed young man, and can write a good love letter, I am sure I have no reason to find fault with him for admiring me, though perhaps I may not marry him for all that, Lady Scudamore. You are certainly under no obligation to marry him, answered her ladyship. 
except that which love himself will dictate to you. For if I am not greatly mistaken, you are at this very moment unknown to yourself, cherishing a most tender affection for him. La, Lady Scudamore, replied I, blushing, how can you think of such a thing? Because every look, every word betrays it, answered she. Come, my dear Henrietta, consider me as a friend, and be sincere with me. Do you not prefer Mr. Musgrove to any man of your acquaintance? Pray, do not ask me such questions, Lady Scudamore, said I, turning away my head, for it is not fit for me to answer them. Nay, my love, replied she, now you confirm my suspicions. But why, Henrietta, should you be ashamed to own a well-placed love, or why refuse to confide in me? I am not ashamed to own it, said I, taking courage. I do not refuse to confide in you or blush to say that I do love your cousin, Mr. Musgrove. That I am sincerely attached to him, for it is no disgrace to love a handsome man. If he were plain indeed, I might have had reason to be ashamed of a passion which must have been mean, since the object would have been unworthy. But with such a figure and face, and such beautiful hair as your cousin has, why should I blush to own that such superior merit has made an impression on me? My sweet girl, said Lady Scudamore, embracing me with great affection. What a delicate way of thinking you have in these matters, and what a quick discernment for one of your years. Oh, how I honor you for such noble sentiments. Do you, ma'am, said I. You are vastly obliging. But pray, Lady Scudamore, did your cousin himself tell you of his affection for me? I shall like him the better if he did. For what is a lover without a confidant? Oh, my love, replied she, you were born for each other. Every word you say more deeply convinces me that your minds are actuated by the invisible power of sympathy, for your opinions and sentiments so exactly coincide. Nay, the color of your hair is not very different. Yes, my dear girl, the poor despairing Musgrove did reveal to me the story of his love. Nor was I surprised at it. I know not how it was, but I had a kind of presentiment that he would be in love with you. Well, but how did he break it to you? It was not till after supper. We were sitting round the fire together, talking on indifferent subjects, though to say the truth the conversation was chiefly on my side, for he was thoughtful and silent. When on a sudden he interrupted me in the midst of something I was saying, by exclaiming in a most theatrical tone, Yes! I'm in love. I feel it now, and Henrietta Halton has undone me. Oh, what a sweet way, replied I, of declaring his passion to make such a couple of charming lines about me. What a pity it is that they are not in rhyme. I am very glad you like it, answered she. To be sure, there was a great deal of taste in it. And are you in love with her cousin, said I. I am very sorry for it, for unexceptionable as you are in every respect, with a pretty estate, capable of great improvements, and an excellent house, though somewhat out of repair, yet who can hope to aspire with success to the adorable Henrietta, who has had an offer from a colonel, and been toasted by a baronet? That I have, cried I. Lady Scudamore continued. Ah, dear cousin, replied he. I am so well convinced of the little chance I can have of winning her, who is adored by thousands, that I need no assurances of yours to make me more thoroughly so. Yet, surely, neither you or the fair Henrietta herself will deny me the exquisite gratification of dying for her, of falling a victim to her charms. And when I am dead, continued her, Oh, Lady Scudamore, said I, wiping my eyes, that such a sweet creature should talk of dying. It is an affecting circumstance indeed, replied Lady Scudamore. When I am dead, said he, let me be carried and lain at her feet, and, perhaps, she may not disdain to drop a pitying tear on my poor remains. Dear Lady Scudamore, interrupted I, say no more on this affecting subject. I cannot bear it. Oh, how I admire the sweet sensibility of your soul, and as I would not for worlds wound it too deeply, I will be silent. Pray, go on, said I. She did so. And then added he, 
Ah, oh, cousin, imagine what my transports will be when I feel the dear precious drops trickle on my face. Who would not die to haste such ecstasy? And when I am interred, may the divine Henrietta bless some happier youth with her affection. May he be as tenderly attached to her as the hapless Musgrove, and while he crumbles to dust, may they live an example of felicity in the conjugal state. Did you ever hear anything so pathetic? What a charming wish to be lain at my feet when he was dead! Oh, what an exalted mind he must have to be capable of such a wish! Lady Scudamore went on. Ah, my dear cousin, replied I to him, such noble behavior as this must melt the heart of any woman, however obdurate it may naturally be. And could the divine Henrietta but hear your generous wishes for her happiness, all gentle as is her mind, I have no doubt but that she would pity your affection and endeavor to return it. Oh, cousin, answered he, do not endeavor to raise my hopes by such flattering assurances. No, I cannot hope to please this angel of a woman and the only thing which remains for me to do is to die. True love is ever desponding, replied I, but I, my dear Tom, will give you even greater hopes of conquering this fair one's heart than I have yet given you, by assuring you that I watched her with the strictest attention during the whole day, and could plainly discover that she cherishes in her bosom, though unknown to herself, a most tender affection for you. Dear Lady Scudamore, cried I, this is more than I ever knew. Did I not say that it was unknown to yourself? I did not, continued I to him, encourage you by saying this at first, that surprise might render the pleasure still greater. No, cousin, replied he in a languid voice. Nothing will convince me that I can have touched the heart of Henrietta Halton, and if you are deceived yourself, do not attempt deceiving me. In short, my love, it was the work of some hours for me to persuade the poor despairing youth that you had really a preference for him. But when at last he could no longer deny the force of my arguments, or discredit what I told him, his transports, his raptures, his ecstasies are beyond my power to describe. Oh, the dear creature, cried I, how passionately he loves me. But, dear Lady Scudamore, did you tell him that I was totally dependent on my uncle and aunt? Yes, I told him everything. And what did he say? He exclaimed with virulence against uncles and aunts, accused the laws of England for allowing them to possess their estates when wanted by their nephews or nieces, and wished he were in the House of Commons, that he might reform the legislature and rectify all its abuses. Oh, the sweet man, what a spirit he has, said I. He could not flatter himself, he added, that the adorable Henrietta would condescend for his sake to resign those luxuries and that splendor to which she had been used, and accept only in exchange the comforts and elegancies which his limited income could afford her, even supposing that his house were in readiness to receive her. I told him that it could not be expected that she would. It would be doing her an injustice to suppose her capable of giving up the power she now possesses, and so nobly uses of doing such extensive good to the poor part of her fellow creatures, merely for the gratification of you and herself. To be sure, said I, I am very charitable, every now and then. And what did Mr. Musgrove say to this? He replied that he was under a melancholy necessity of owning the truth of what I said and that therefore if he should be the happy creature destined to be the husband of the beautiful Henrietta, he must bring himself to wait, however impatiently, for the fortunate day when she might be freed from the power of worthless relations and able to bestow herself on him. What a noble creature he is! Oh, Matilda, what a fortunate one I am, who am to be his wife! My aunt is calling me to come and make the pies, so adieu, my dear friend, and believe me yours, etc. H. Halton. Finis. End of Letter the Fifth. End of A Collection of Letters by Jane Austen.